יקה היה יוהן, קלצ'יש, וצ'ין חסתי, אך תהו יקה, עדי יג'י נהיה היו חתן ידעת. כלי יקה היה עקת חצהו אך אך חואה, ורקורד, כך שצ'אכו, כך שצ'אכו, עד שוויצו יג'י כך תונה, יש כך אין שקשני ידעת. יאווה, ג'אגו חסא אווי, יוהאן, וג'ין חסתי ידת. יאווה אכתו וסגו, יאה יוחתנגי, שטוטלטו וגאו. יאג'טייך יאח אווי אוהאן, ג'טייך יאח, שטוין חגך תושייך, יאווה אכתו ותי. וגא אווי, וג'ין יגח תודלאק. כש אכתו אשגו צ'או אויה, ג'טייך נח אייה. יאיתי חאתי שהש, טרק טרק, יאווח תוסגו, ווץ' יקח תוסחה, הו, היאגו יקטחנו, היאגו יקטחנו, יאיקאי את חג'ידי כך תותי, יאווח חאת כך תכוך ונכנינס, התוסגו, כנחוי הנשיתי אווה היאגו, יאווח תותי. It's a great day. Everybody's here. Uh, I'm thankful that we could be together. Uh, the other day I forgot to hit the record button. So uh, we will do the Yesh Kachan Shkashni, those parts again. So we can walk through it together. And I'm always happy that when we're here, when we're learning, I really want it to feel like a place where we are united in what we're trying to do. It doesn't mean we always have to think the same and agree with each other 100% of the time, but I, want, I don't want anybody to feel like they're alone, just drifting out on the water. I think our philosophy should be, hey, get in this canoe. We're going to go give good things to people, and we're going to go paddle around and really try to you could say, we're going to go boating around, or that works for driving around. You could say, we're going to go paddling. And you could say, that's what you, that's what you want. Like if you're in a, like a shlingit yagu, and everyone's really paddling together, and that thing really starts to glide. Say, yanashit canoe was just gliding right across the water. That's what we're trying to do. So I thought I'd uh, share that kind of stuff. You just, sometimes the days get darker, the thing gets more challenging, and people just drift off. So without any sense of shame or guilt or anything, we just want to say, hey, get back in the canoe, let's go. And so uh, just words of encouragement as we sort of keep going. There was a question right before we hit the record about colors, and I'll share, I'll put this on our class webpage tonight. Uh, we do have a poster, it's called a complex color poster. So now you get a whole bunch of variations of colors. Now you go look up all these nouns, but now we get all these different shades of blacks and grays and silvers and whites and bluish gray. Tzik, kawut, those are those old Russian trade beads. That's that smoky kind of a light blue color. Uh, this one is, there are a few that are coast specific. Kheish is one. I think of Khats as a lighter blue than this, but it's the blue of the sky, just because if, uh, if it's a really clear sky, you would talk, but it, it's also just the word for sky. And so the sky is all kinds of different colors. But this is probably one of my favorites. Uh, I would probably say nachin teh as one word. And nachin teh uh, comes from this kind of little, kind of a clay type of thing, I don't know. But it's really hard to find, and if you go get it, you gotta be real fast because you're gonna unleash a really big storm. But this is where we used to get that clingit bluish green that you see in all the old things. 
Uh, and not a, lot, not a lot of people know that. So uh, this would be sum. So that W turns to an M and the green turns to blue when you go inland. Let's see, we got copper, gold, uh, kind of a blondish kind of a hair, dog pee yellow. That's also, that's just one of my favorites. I don't know why. Uh, we did an activity here where we had our students volunteer for some, I tease students a lot. If you didn't know me, and there's probably a lot of people who's like, gosh, he's mean to his students, but we got them all these bright yellow t-shirts and we were calling, I was teasing them. Ketchuku pu'u, I was calling them dog pee people. And, but it was just for fun. But many of them were mad at me. But one of them, she said, and then she looked around, she said, gee, we're all just puddled up here. <laughs> so it was fun. It was like an extension of the joke. Sechwani uh, is uh, sometimes called old man's beer or Uznia. Uh, then you got this little songbird or eagle beak. Uh, let's see. Apple, shuk is a robin, sheikh, those two are related, you know, words. Uh, let's see, sheikh is pretty important, it's ochre, that's also the word for face paint. Uh, Tzakwat is the inner part of the hemlock bark, usually, I think. Shikun uh, uh, shikun is a word for both an oyster catcher and a, what is the, the big puffin, whatever that one's called? What's the little one called? What's the big one called? Nobody know? I'm mean, in English. Tufted or horned. Okay. Whichever one's little, is that tufted? That one's chik. Little one's chik, big one's chikun. Sometimes things have the same name but then they usually don't appear in the same place. It's kind of wild. Like, I don't think the oyster catcher and the, and the big puffin appear in the same spot, but I don't know. Also, there's a tree called duck. Anybody know what duck is? Cotton. Cotton. Well, that is the same name for poplar, but they're usually not in the same place. I, just, I asked speakers, I was like, how do you know which one you're talking about? They're like, yeah, just know. All right. Uh, fire. This is pretty cool. It's like, uh, when the sun is really setting in red, it's, uh, the sun is frying it, is what that translates to. Uh, fried urine, there's no picture of that, so I don't, I don't even know. I didn't, I wasn't there when that was named. Um, and so I just share this stuff. Some people get mad at me, but I'm like, I didn't make that name. That's an old name. Uh, strawberries. I'd probably put an apostrophe here and make that one word. Those are those little low bush, those ground marsh cranberries. Purple. Uh, water. Snow. And then cots. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I will put this up so that folks uh, have access to it. So, I think we should talk about direction and location. But let me just check in. Anybody got any language thoughts or questions? Things you're wondering? Things you want to share? Okay. Huh. The colors, are they pre-contact or post-contact? It's probably a mix, but I would say um, Yaro Vara worked at Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. Sakjaye is her Shingit name, and she is the one who gathered all this. And when I was talking to her about it, she said she talked to a whole bunch of speakers, and when she did this work, there were still quite a few speakers on Prince of Wales and a bunch of different communities, and she just talked as many as she could. And most of them said these were pre-contact things, which is wild. But still, there is this sort of thing. You could make an argument that colors aren't that important in Tlingit. I'll tell you why I think that. Because you say yachyati, so it means it's like this other thing. So that means there's no words for colors. And if you look at all those old speeches, all those old stories, you don't find any color at all, like hardly ever. Maybe there's like a white in there to talk about Maybe there's like a or something like that. Also, as a reminder, you could say 
it is pink. But if you want to say like a pink, uh, I don't know, cat, what you would do is you would put y, y, i, low tone, right at the end of this verb. Shush, yuch, y, t, y, douche. That's how you would do pink cat. You wouldn't really say shush, douche, because that just sounds like fiery cat. It's, it's, you can't tell the difference. There are some exceptions. There is glate hicht. There is glate uh, ha. There are some things that do uh, where this transfers over tuch ayi like that. That's a place around. They call it tushai. Tuch ayi is a black lake, and so it sometimes it'll just cut the thing out. But it there's some naming convention there that like it becomes a place name or some really important thing like it's Gleit Hicht because people were building a house and they dug up this big frog, this giant frog that was frozen and totally white. So they said thought out and they thought out and came back, you know, comes back to life like frogs do. And so they, they took that name and that image. Why do you think there might not have been a lot of uses of like colors as words? I just think it wasn't an important concept yeah. in Tlingit. Like this, it's pretty wild. There's this language in like Papua New Guinea and they have like two words for color. Yeah. And it doesn't, you might think like light colors or dark colors, but like I was reading about it, I was just like, it's kind of like if you, if you showed them different colors, they would tell you which one it was. And there didn't seem to be a recognizable pattern to it. Mm. So it's pretty wild to just think like within languages and, and there's a whole bunch of like stuff like I just think people teach kids colors all the time, right? Because you give them crayons and do all this other stuff. But like in Tlingit a long time, it was probably like not a real important thing. Then we only use like three colors in our artwork too. Yeah. So that's the other thing. I think I've heard some other stories like too, like when I was looking at like the original Iliad in Greek and like there's not a lot of use of colors either. And the way it is used, it's used in like weird ways. Like they'll say like the blind colored sea. And you're like, wait a second. I think it's blind dark. Something like Which that. Which means it yeah. wasn't light. Like, I mean, the difference <laughs> right. between dark green or dark blue and dark red might not have been all that important. Right? Yeah. 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 yeah, I think Tlingit, the only time they probably talk about colors, like, hey, you got the wrong shade of red. <laughs> so yeah. something like that. Right? Yeah, it's a good question, though. And, and so some of this stuff is fun to kind of explore and to think, like, we're all in this spot in between English and Tlingit. And there's not a whole lot of us who are in that spot as we start to. You all are just becoming full-on speakers of Tlingit, which is amazing. But that means you're going to have a bunch of these thoughts and questions. That's, that's really one of the reasons why we keep sort of pushing the groups together, too. It's like, get to know each other, hang out with each other, because you guys have to be the ones who talk to each other. Any other thoughts, questions? So the next kind of phase of our learning has to do with direction and location. Where things are at, where they're going, how they might be going there, or how they might just be there. These things are linked to, there, there's time, space, location, movement are all linked together. And then there's, there's it's tough sometimes to sort of uh, mark exactly how all of this stuff works. So it's going to be very common with stuff like this where you start to learn it, then you start to use it, then you just have to adjust it. It's just part of the process. Because Slingit has like a whole bunch of different things. Like it's this, but then when it's that thing, you use this thing, but don't use that thing for the other things, and there's a whole bunch of stuff like that. So we're going to talk about this in these kind of three major phases. Then our activity is going, and this comes from Intermediate Tlingit, developed by uh, Richard Dauenhauer, Kechne, Nora Dauenhauer, uh, and a whole bunch of other folks that they worked with. Where you sort of learn a concept, and then you got these like lists of things to go and sort of memorize. That's sometimes the hard part, is like just going and memorizing these things. But having these lists is helpful 
And then what we're going to do is we're going to go into some of the stories and we're going to go looking for these things to see how they work. And there are some that are just absolutely common and you need to know them. Then there's a whole bunch that are a little bit more rare, like, you know, upland from, because you can say behind it and there's like three different ways to say behind it, if it's behind a person or if it's behind a thing, or if it's behind something and it's also further away from the ocean, on the ocean, on the landward side of it. So we're also going to come into these sort of categories. So ask questions if you got them. We're going to start going through this stuff. And we'll go through this a couple times. How Senea Chayu Khatangi has a whole chapter de devoted to this, and you should be reading it this week. Uh, let's actually take a look at that chapter so I could show you. Because I think it's helpful, like I'll tell you this stuff, we'll look at examples, and then you go read this stuff, and then we're going to go dig through the stories to see how this stuff works. And then I'll give you some translation exercises to talk about how this stuff could also work. Okay, let me open something. So this, uh, this text, which we'll probably have a third edition next year, who knows, like some of the stuff, like I just keep sort of, as I teach more Tlingit, I realize more about Tlingit, then I got to adjust the way that I document these things. And so it was pretty fun. Like uh, probably eight years ago, I asked an administrator here, I was like, y'all got to give me a printer. I got to have my own printer. And they said, well, you can just print like everybody else. I said, no, like there's no materials to teach this stuff. Well, I, I got to make it. So, and, and so there were folks before you all who just dealt with just so much paper because it wasn't finished. It was like being developed as we went through. And uh, I would apologize to the trees every night because I would just be throwing paper all around. But this is the chapter. So chapter seven. And I call these directional and relational terms. So you talk about kind of where something's at, where it might be headed or coming from, and how it's doing those things. All of those things are encoded. And so there are some terms that we're going to look at when we do this stuff. And not everybody who speaks and teaches and, and uses Tlingit uses the same terms for these. So. Uh, these are the ways that I sort of understand it, uh, but read that chapter, it's chapter seven. So we're gonna look at this thing in these three different sort of chunks. Chunk number one is things that are relative to the speaker. Whoever's talking, it's close to them or far from them. So, you know, we've, we've looked at these before in beginning Klingit, we've looked at them this semester, and we'll look at it again because we're going to start putting suffixes on these things and really looking at how the suffixes work. The second one is between two objects, under it, around it, over it, through it, those types of things. But there has to be these two things, right, next to it, those types. The third is these universal points in the Tlingit consciousness, which is a lot of it has to do with the ocean. No matter if you're inland, coastal, island, whatever, same stuff built into the ground. It's built right into it.
little thing was, it was kind of breaking last week. Okay, can you? Okay, where was I? You had just finished up talking about relation to fixed universal points. And then I saw polysynthetic be highlighted. <laughs> okay, well, uh, not only is the sound going to cut out, but I'm wearing a mask. I can't even read lips. We'll make it just as complicated as can be. Okay, there's something wonky going on with this little microphone thing, which is scary because they don't make them anymore. So I'll, I'll have to get a hold of the people and see. Maybe on break I can have them look at it and fix it, whoever made it. Okay. So again, Schengen is a polysynthetic language. So these things, the verbal structure is related to this stuff because you're going to use verbs in combination. Sometimes they're going to affect verbs like in very specific ways. Uh, so we just keep in mind, Schengen is polysynthetic, which means there's a whole bunch of little parts that you string together and they kind of smoosh into each other. So our practice here is to pull those things apart, look at what they all are, and then put it back together. So that we can learn how to do that stuff ourselves because you can only memorize, so you cannot memorize the chunks. You can start learning with big chunks of language, like big phrases and fill in the blank here and there. But at some point, we're going to have to learn what every single thing is and what it does. And, you know, that's what we're going to do. Klingit is always classifying stuff. It loves categories. And sometimes it's going to be doing multiple things at the same time. So you're going to get a whole bunch of stuff. Like, how do you say it's there? Well, there's four different ways to say it, depending on how it's there. How do you say, like, you gave it to me? Well, it depends on what kind of thing it is, right? So we're just going to keep an eye on those things when they start popping up on us. Pronouns are built into verbs, and the verbs conjugate for event instead of time. Okay, so let's look at this first set. These things relative to the speaker. There's not very many of these ones, but we will look at the, the sort of next slideshow after this shows like what happens when we start putting the suffixes onto all of these things? So we've seen this before. Can somebody give me the brief overview? What is this showing us? Yeah, it's right here in Yeah, is right here. What is he? Like nearby, but you can't see? It's nearby, but you might have to sort of kind of lean over to get it. Or it could be closer to me than you. It could be right behind me. Or it could be somewhere, but I can't see it. It's kind of mysterious, perhaps. It could be any one of those things. What about weh? Weh you? Not you. Is it there, but like I can see it, but it's over there, not within reach? Yeah, it's there. So you got to kind of go, you got to go to it, but it's not, you probably don't have to leave the room to get it, right? Where or leave the space that you're in. So that's how these are working, like here, right here, here, there, way over there. That's how they work, right? So you could use these. Slingit doesn't use the or a or n. So uh, you could say ya yeh, we yeh, you yeh, if there are these three ravens. Or in this case, you could have a tsao, ya tsao. It's right next to the speaker. That's what they're talking about. It's right next to me. We tsao. It's over there. He tsao. It's pretty close to me, but not right next to me. You tsao. It's way over there. That's one way these can work. We're going to look at some other ways they work because you can start putting suffixes on them and other things. We'll look at that a little later. Just want to make sure we grasp 
this concept. You see this in all kinds of stuff too, with aya, ahe, awe, ayu. You could say all of those things. Ya do, he do, we do, you do. Ya ta, he ta, we ta, you ta. Ya, he, we, you. Those are all based on these four things. At their core, they're all about here, right here, here, there, way over there. They can also mark time. The ones who are, that are usually going to do that is ya, which would be right now, and you. Long time ago, a long time from now. Ask questions if you got them. We're going to keep going. So when you got more than one person, the shared space around them is ha. Now, I think it has a bunch of homonyms. It's not a big deal. Every language has them. There's only so many sounds you can make. So there's another ha and another ha, right? This one is this space around us. But then you're going to get a whole bunch of things that you sort of used or heard, like hagu, hade, hatiyagut, those types of things are using this. Hadadushi, it's using this. So the ha part is around us in this vicinity of people who are sharing the same space. For example, uh, I gotta move the chat to the other screen. So you can have these two folks, and they're sharing a space here, and this one can say hagu. So this is two words that smush together. Ha is this space, g is a command form to get over here. Uh, we put the N in parentheses because sometimes that N will pop up there. Like you'll say han de. You could also say ha de. Those are the same thing. So then when the person comes over, they could say yik a hot yiku di. So this T pops up on there. That is a suffix which means to be at somewhere. And it could signal, it most often says it arrived. But it could also signal moving around at. Some of these they get a little confusing because they got multiple meanings. If you had more than one person, you could say yake hot ye adi. It's good you all came. This is it's good that you came here. Any questions about those ones? Ya, he, we, you, ha. So the ha good. That was you come over here to us. Yeah. Anybody know, uh, like, what if this was two people? How would, you couldn't say haku because that's just one person. Anybody know how to say y'all come here? Ha ya. Ha ya. Ye away. So that T pops up there. It gets kind of gobbled up. I think it also has endings that fall off sometimes. Because this g is good but the T falls off. It's not common that that happens in a verb. Okay. Kind of cheesh. So with ha, ha, he, ha, oh, that it's going to be just Y, E, E, period, hyphen, A. So ha, T, A is going to be, uh, let me put it over here. So it's going to, so there's the ha, but it's going to be uh, this. Hatia. That's to a group of people. Hatia. That's all of That's all the ones that are related to the speaker. You just have those five things. Ya, he, we, you, ha. That's all of them. You got them all. But the, the next step is sort of figure out what happens when we start putting suffixes on them. Okay? Is there ever asked more questions about that, oh. about that one scenario? So, hagu implies that there are more than one person in the area, right? If you were telling, so, ha, ah, 
would that still work if it was just you there and you were talking to like three people over there? Yeah, so ha doesn't need to have more than one person. Oh. It just means this area. Because you wouldn't really, you couldn't say like yaku, like it doesn't make sense. Okay. You could say, you could say yade naku, but people won't, they wouldn't prefer to say that. It's sort of like saying, come right here. You would say, ah naku, come be next to me. Haku is just sort of like, come over to this area. So the ha is more like a, just an area. Uh, okay. Once we start talking about, because we can't share the ya, we just switch it to ha. There are other things, uh, like here's a cultural thing. There's this phrase, ha de. Anybody know when you use that? That's like more of a command. Right? It's like right now. Right? Well, it's a command. But then there are three, there's these three days. Okay, so you have. Uh, day low tone day also low tone but then you have day which is a high tone oh did i say three i meant four so there are four days four days in a okay. this one low tone long and low that's a road or a trail that is a noun it's a road or a trail like you say yakudei there's a yakudei every coastal community probably has a yakudei which is a place where you bring a canoe up out of the water, and a katini, which is a sockeye river, and a gunhini, which is a spring. Those three things. If you got those three things, put a village there. This low tone day pops up before the verb, and it, it, so this is an adverb. Adverbs pop up before the verb. This means already happened. So you got some know-it-all who tells you something, you can say, de chasaku, I already knew it. But don't say that to like elders. Because then you'll sound, you'll sound like you're bragging. And you'll get smacked down. But this, this also, you'll see it in other things. Like it had already happened, it had already sort of done the thing. There's a high-toned day that pops up after a verb, which is like, hurry up. So, you could say any any command form, you throw day on it, and now you're getting getting real bossy. So make sure the kinship aligns. You're not commanding your parents or uncles or aunties or grandparents, but the nieces, nephews. So you could say, you could say, a hagu day will often contract a haku day. Haku day is like, get over here right now. But that's that. So this one comes after. So let me go verb day so that we can just sort of see these a little bit more clearly. Oops. And then day verb. So then you have day that attaches to a noun, and this one is towards. That's the one that's popping up right here. So ha day towards this space. The loose translation of this is bring it here. However, you should only use it in really casual settings where everybody knows each other really well. Like, uh, let's say you're looking for your keys. And I say, huh, got to, ah, here it is. And you can say, hot day, bring it here. If we know each other really well, that's totally fine. If we don't know each other really well, you would use a command verb and you'd say, achjit uh, sati. Hand them, hand them here. However, here's a cultural thing. If you are at a kuik, a potlatch, and they're giving stuff away, and you are a guest, and they call your name, they say, Juni Shahit, and I got this dish of stuff for you, you should yell out, Hade, really loud. Like yell it, that's just part of the ku ik kusti. It's the ku ik culture. Sometimes people will get offended because maybe people are shy. It's like, I don't even know what hot day means. They want me to just yell this stuff. I don't want to yell at people. But in think you're supposed to. Sometimes we'll just really stare at someone and be like, say the word. So it's a cultural word as well. Okay. 
Ask him if you go. Two objects and how they're related. So the starting point for this, now let me jump to this slide. In English, what do we call these things? Under, over, around, through? Uh, postposition. In English, they're called preposition. preposition. But in Shingit, they are called postpositions. So yes, you are 100% correct. You went to the Shingit brain first, which is good. So the reason they're called prepositions in English is because they're pre, they come before the noun, right? Under the table, on the table, around the table. So to push it into Shingit, jump it to the other side and don't say the. You don't need the the part because we don't use that in Shingit. We don't use articles. So if you want to start using Shingit grammar with English language, somebody like, hey, may I see my cup? Table on. Jump right to it, fast. That's how Shingit works. We call them postpositions because they come after the noun every single time. Non-negotiable has to come after the noun. Sometimes you will get the noun and then they'll switch to a. Uh, very common. Yenadak, a yachoe gachtirin. This that table, we're gonna sit around it. So that's when it switches to a. Uh. So, what this illustration shows is a, a bunch of concepts just kind of illustrated for you for a starting point to start thinking about this stuff. There are three ways these things are marked. If there's nothing on either side of the word, that word can stand on its own. The key is up high. It doesn't need anything before it. You can just, it's independent. You could just say the key. You could just say that. If it has a long dash, an N dash, it needs a noun before it. A yik, yak yik, de yik, askatu yik, heen yik must have a noun in front of it. If it's a short hyphen, that is a suffix that attaches to a noun, or what we'll figure, what we'll hear next is a base. Any questions about that? When you say like in the case of yik, you mean it needs a noun before it but not attached to it? Yes. Whereas the short is. Yes. So this dash means write it as its own word, but it has to belong to that noun. So yes, yak yik, two words. Yak yik de two words. So the short ones, so day and dach and nach, should always attach to a noun. You can't say them on their own. You can't just say nach. You can't just say dach. You, it just doesn't work. And you could tell by the, the dash, or you could tell by where it is. The dash, right? Yes, it's the dash. So like long dash, own word, needs to belong to and that's how we write kinship now that's how we write uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff body parts we write those they used to always have du or a uh. but what what i think a lot of teachers realize is like everybody kept saying du or a uh. they wouldn't substitute it with a noun let's say yak a uh, yik it should just be yak yik fach an san So I really would like to, um, I used to teach prepositions to second graders doing a rap and doing it by opposites. So I'd like to challenge and do it with in Tlingit. So I don't know if it's okay to, to um, introduce these in pairs. So I know which ones are like, if they are opposites, and then I can organize them that way. Yeah, yeah, okay. sure. let's look at some pairs that are on here. So the key, is that way up above? De yi is down below. Okay, so de ki, de yi. So when missionaries came here, they're like, how could you translate these concepts? You end up with de ki and kawu and de yi and kawu. Anybody want to guess what those are? Or do you know? God and the devil. God and the devil, right? So the, the 
the big person up high and the big person down low. Ankawu is a person of the land. So there's two, kin and yin. Those also can be said, they usually, these ones, I haven't figured out how to mark this, but these ones usually want to have a suffix. You're most often going to say kinde and yinde, which I, I should just change that to kinde and yinde. Is that but, what you do with like kinde chone? What's that? Um, like you're saying kinde chone and then like a mallard thing? Is that the same? Yeah, kinda chune. Kin upwards, da around, chunate arrow. Straight up like an arrow. Because when you watch it take off, it just goes, like it just kind of goes really straight. Uh, so yeah, you'll see these in a bunch of names as well. But if we look at the first letter, K, Y, K, Y, you're going to get that as well. K, Y, Kinde, Yinde, Diki, Diyi. So you see both of those already just sort of being in opposition to each other. Kegu, go up it. Yegu, go down it. You'd actually say it was a little different, but because you say kewugut, they went up it. Yewugut, they went down. Hune, oh. I'm just thinking with the students. Could we use rather than a box? Could we use their hand as the relational and say? So it'd be jin, jin de ki, jin. De, Jin de ki, and then, and then if I was doing kinde, it's actual movement. So if I said jin kinde, it's actually showing the movement going upwards. I, I think that works. Like so, you could say kinde yinde. I wouldn't want to put the body part into it, uh, just because usually you'd use a verb that would be k jishetsak, would be. But here you hear the k in there, k jishetsak. So the jishet sak means extend the stick hand. And so that's how Shenge thinks of things. You got, you got stick arms, right? So jishet sak would be, uh, but I think you could do it without getting to that verb. You could do it later. And you could do uh, kinde, yinde. There are folks from the language nest in Yakutat who are using a cup. So they'd use a cup and they'd say, ada, ada, and then I can't remember how the song, but they'd say, kanach and atai and aka. Yeah, like try, try, and just try things. Like just try things out. And we can always look at them later and see how it's working. And if you just want to say, like, your hand is going to go up, you could say, kidney, yeah. and you could do it. I would say, do it without verbs for now. Okay. It, just starting to introduce, or you could use the English verbs, like it's going to go kinde, it's going to go yinde, because if you're teaching young people the language, and they're getting it in these sort of chunks, and you know, teaching adults, you could do all this like big explanations and stuff, but it's not going to work with little, little kids. You got to get right to some stuff, and we should probably do some of this stuff too. This will probably help us teach it in the future. Yeah. But just we would do above my hand, below my hand, between my hand, through my hand, around my hand. And they were based in opposites before, after, you know, like all of the to help with English language learners. And then we would just go above, below, you know, between, through, around. Can I do the same thing where we first like show Jin? Like just something that's on their body so that they can do it anywhere without anything and then just do the prepositions or it wouldn't that's not really okay. I think it's I think it works. Okay. But what, what you'll find is you will find a whole bunch of concepts that are just different in Shingit. So the key is up above and the yi is down below, but those have nothing to do with above or below a particular thing. So if you said ijin de ki, I would think your hand is up high. I would it wouldn't have anything to do with where something is in relation to your hand. But you could say ijin kina. So there's kin plus there's this other thing. Um, 
We're going to put this thing up here. Sorry, I don't want to make it more complicated. Go ahead and do what you were <laughs> I don't want you to um, feel like you have to change it for me. I can talk to you about it later, but that is my goal because I'm going to memorize these things and I'd like to do it with my, with my students. <laughs> Uh, and son, I have a recommendation. Um, the way I learned post positions was like an easier version of this through the Children of the Taku Schlinget Klech textbook. And it's actually really cute, like would be easier to do with kids, I would say, because they're half the amount of the post positions, more of like the starting point. And we had a little kusi gank yesh and a little square that we cut out, like as on a box. And then we just like face the teacher and they say like yesh uh, tai and put the little crow underneath the box. And then you'd say like yesh um, tu and like put it inside the box. So it would show that it was like inside the box. And that might be a little bit easier, I think, to do with your students if you start from, <laughs> from there. Because I, yeah, it was easy for, it was a lot easier for me to comprehend this when I did that first. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness, cheese. Yay! I would love that. Goodness, cheese. Would you be willing to demonstrate that on Thursday, maybe, for us? Oh, oh. Cheese. Okay. Great. Yeah, great questions. Um, I do want to sort of talk about this thing. So, I think this thing was like, uh, nya. I think that's what it used to be. And now you're going to see it all over the place as yina or niya. It, it has changed. And it also, like when you hear something like kin, kinna and yina, which would be kinak adi, that's like the jacket, kinak adi is an over thing. That's literally what it translates to. So kinna is above. Uh, Hit dayina is the downstairs of a house. So you're going to see this. Sometimes it's going to just go straight to na sometimes. It's also, there's a place called henya. There's a place called sanya. Uh, there's a whole bunch of place names that have niya or something. Hunia is huna, uh, which becomes huna. So sometimes we've got to reconstruct some things in the language to see how these work. And this could mean in the area of it, shielding it or protecting it. Um, that's kind of usually one of those two things. Okay. So in terms of how to start learning this stuff, up above, down below, like we're going to, we'll take a look at some examples. I'll, I'll tell you everyone that's on here, just so that you know. But I don't, I don't want you to feel like you got to look at this box and I need to know everything on this box by tomorrow. It's nothing like that. Instead, like we're going to just look at these things. There, If you look at the chapter in How Sene Chayuk Atungi, it breaks them into these lists, which is like, here's the most common ones. Here are some other ones. Here are some rarely used ones, but you're going to run into them sometimes. One of the ones you'll see the most is da, around it or about it. So this, there's a whole bunch of things with da in it. Okay, so there's da. Uh, I think another one that you'll see an awful lot is ka, on it. Uh, and so ka and da, and these two are also very commonly put onto verbs. A whole bunch of verbs, any verb with ka in it, it's got this, which has, they're the same word at their base sort of point. And with this one, ya, the face of it or the vertical surface. So like you take a word like ta, which is a board, ta ka, the floor, ta ya, the wall, right? Hit ka the roof. Hit ka ye below the roof, the ceiling. So sometimes these things stack in very logical ways. And you'll see them, how they sort of work. Some other ones, ta ye 
is below or underneath. Yi is below. I don't think I have it on this one. Tu is inside a closed container. This one can this technically this one contains an air. So tu is inside a closed container or your mind, which is also well, that's a closed container, right? You don't want to open a head. But it's also inside of abstract concepts sometimes. Yik is in, but it's usually specific shallow containers. So this is where the categories come in. Day yik. That's how you're in the road. Because a road is a river, and you're going to be heen yik. But heen yik has two meanings. It could be you're in the water, but it's too shallow to submerge yourself if you like lay down. Or a boat, something that floats on the water, like a boat or a duck or whatever. That's heen yik as well. Water gets really complicated. We'll get there because there's on the surface of the water, below the surface, a whole bunch of stuff. But if you were actually to say in this box, it's ka. I put yik on there because I wanted to be able to talk about it because it's important. It's an important concept. You yik, yik. Things can yik in a tree, in a forest, in a road, in a river, in a boat, and in a car. Even though you close the doors, you would yik into a car because a, a road is a river and a car is a boat. That's just all there is to it. Case closed. Any questions? So, uh, ya and ka are opposites. Ya is a vertical on it face, and ka is a horizontal on it. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say those ones are opposites. They're sort of they're perpendicular. So that, but I think you can do some really neat things where they meet each other. And you can have you can have both of them in a verb. You can have ya and ka. In a verb. But ta uh, ka is the floor, ta uh, ya is the wall. I think that's a good starting point for like how to get those ones down. You're going to be on it, you're going to be on the face of it. Okay, okay. Let's do the suffixes and then we'll take a. I have another question. Ah. I've taught my dog day in day, like if she jumps up on the couch. Um, can I, can the kinde also be a thing? So, For, like, to tell her to come up by me? Oh, so, like, yeah, the kinde would be um, up, and then the yinde would be down. So, uh, kin and yin can also have di in front. It's totally optional. The kin and the yin. It doesn't change the meaning. Uh, and it's, so yeah, so you could say kin, kinde. And you can say yin day, or you can say dikin day, yin day. If I was telling my dog to get on the couch, you, I, I think I would probably say a kakkeku. That's probably what I'd say. Uh, uh, I'll write it over here. So even though the dog is probably going to, it might jump, so, but I'm, you could say jump, but this is, keiku would be to get up, to go up. On, it, up, go. Then if I wanted to say, you bad dog, get off that couch, I would say, akakiku. So akak is off of it. Uh, so this comes from ka plus dach. And we're going to look at this also. The, the next thing after this is like what happens when you start combining these because sometimes you get unpredictable things that you just have to remember. We're trying to step our way through this stuff. 
a kach would be get down off of it. This could work for all kinds of stuff. You got dog ones. Our dog was a puppy. She's kind of, she's kind of medium sized dog. And I came in and she was on the kitchen table. So I had to teach her. I only had to tell her once. I said, and she just got off there. And she never got on there, but she didn't know. She's like, oh, look, there's all this food up here. It's great. But then, you know, some dogs never learn. Or some dogs, like, they wait till you leave. And, like, they'll never know. But then all this food's all over the place. <laughs> good question. Good question. And, but just go for it, too. Go for it. Try to use these things out. Start to look at, you know, your brain has to do a lot of work to figure out how this stuff works. And I think the only way to get it is by just keep using them, come back, report on what you're trying to do, and then we'll just adjust it if we have to. But I think you could say, you could say kende and yende, those would be really short forms to do it, like up and down. Instance. Oh. Okay, so the suffixes, and we're going to look at these a little bit more closely. Day is towards. Dach is away from. There's two opposites right there. De dach, de dach. However, they must always be attached to a noun. You can never say these by themselves. You're going to end up with a de and a dach. Or you could say hit de hit dach, nadak de nadak dach, achande achandach. Nach is through or along, depending on how it's being used, through or along. Uh, those are probably the two, or the three that I think are on here. Now we'll look at some others. Just to sort of go around and see, make sure we've got all the things that are on here. A is behind. Talk is in a cavity. We're gonna look at these things too. Like, talk is also, I think it's got like some really fun logic that goes on here. Like the yik thing, like you can't really guess. You just gotta sort of, okay, there's the thing at logic for me. You yik in a tree, yik in a forest, yik in the road, yik in a river, yik in a boat. When you go talk, that's in the water, deep enough to submerge or underwater, all those Hintok names, they got talk built into them. Other things that have a talk would be in like a big cliff, like in between two cliffs, that would be talk down there. Some unpredictable things that have a talk is a fire in your eyeball. That's just how Shingit looks at these things. Talk is in between two things. Talk is next to something. For example, Tuck Dane Tan. There was a place called Tuck Dane Hit in the vicinity next to it. They built a house right next to another house. So you'll see these things in clan names and stuff, Nanya'ayi, the southern things, or the northern things, upriver things. Let's see. I think that's all. How is talk and hun different? Say that again. How is talk and hun different? Oh, okay. Talk. This works better for being next to. Um, hun is right beside, and hun has two other. Uh, well, I guess for hun, I think of it as being with. A person. For example, I think it's the same thing that's in the verb root, sechan, for love, because it doesn't, it doesn't move like the other verb roots. You can't say chan. It never goes long. It stays short and hot. Chana would be a spouse or his life partner. Ach chana, the one who's next to me. Um, and then chan used for people is usually talking about like going to visit someone or something like that. Tak is just generally beside. However, 
If I put ach in front of this, and it got possessed, so I can say ach, ach, ayah, yata. People usually wouldn't say that. It's near me. But if you put a possessive marker on this, you end up with ach, ach. Does anybody know what that is? Ach, ach. Comes from this word. It is a sibling. My siblings. Good questions. And yeah, there's going to be like some fine tuned differences between these as well. But don't, like, this is a whole set of concepts. And every language treats these things differently. So don't be upset if it works different in Tlingit than it does in English. Just be like, oh, how, how interesting, how cool. I, sometimes you want to know why, and maybe there'll be reasons why. And sometimes be like, just how it is. Take five. Okay, come back in five minutes. Should I pause it? Do I dare? Somebody remind me when we come back. Okay, so we're going to start, we'll, we'll look at these things for about 10 more minutes, and then we're going to move to our translation exercise. And we're going to spend Thursday looking at this stuff as well. A few of these are going to take a while to sort of, to just get. I think some of them we'll get right away, and we'll just see how they're being used. Others, it's going to take a little while. But so here's another concept. So what I was noticing with these is there are some of them that stand alone. And what I mean is like, it's a word that means to belong to another word, but it cannot take a suffix. Then there are other ones that can take a suffix. So I wanted to sort of separate those out so that we can learn them and then realize which ones we can add a suffix to and which ones we can't. Because that, that it's a big deal, right? Whether you can or not. Because then you might have to add another one and then put a suffix on there, which we'll which we'll we'll look at how that works. So the first group, I call them relational because they need to belong to something, right? So I use that term a lot. Relational just means gotta belong to. It's another noun that it belongs to, and not like it owns one noun owns the other, but there's something in between them, right? So a relational noun must follow another noun. Ach, da, about me. That could also mean my body. Uh, and then you could say hit, da, around the house. Uh, but the relational noun cannot take a suffix. So sometimes if I put, if you look in the dictionary that I've been working on, if it says relational noun, what that word means is it must belong to another noun and it cannot take a suffix. You can't put dach or de or nach onto them. For example, oh, and it's marked with this dash. The word shagoon. Shagoon on its own could be the origin of something. It could be the ancestor of something. It could be... Uh, the lineage, the, the parts that make it up, like uh, if you took an alarm clock and you just took it all apart and laid all the pieces out there, that, those would all technically be gao shagun, the parts of the drum. But I could also tell you, like Gatorade shagun, oh, that could be the story of how Gatorade was invented. So shagun, it can work for any of those things. But when you put, uh, some of these have special meanings when you start to change the type of noun. So you could say, ach shagun. Now I'm talking about my lineage. So if I said, in kakkonik ach shagun dot. If I said that, in kakkonik, I'm going to tell you, ach shagun dot, about my shagun. If I use that singular pronoun, 
you should expect me to talk about my mom, my dad, their parents, and just sort of like a family tree type of thing. Hashagun, it's, I would actually translate this, our ancestors is good, but I would also say it's this, it's everything we've ever been, everything we are now, and everything we will become. That word means all of those things. So some of these get into these really big philosophical concepts as well. When you put ha in front of them. But you can't say ach shagun de, ach shagun dach, ach shagun nach. You, you had to put something else to attach that suffix to. That's what the term relational noun is talking about. A relational base, it has all these same things except it can take a suffix. I think it's important to know that difference. So chun and da, around, uh, about, concerning, it's called mean a body. Uh, chun is near, at the house of, by, visiting. So here's the toward suffix. Come be by me, come visit me, come be with me. Like, it could be any of those things. Uh, they went to them. I'm trying to update all these pronoun uses. Here's one here. It's none of your business. It doesn't concern you. As far as how to use that phrase, this can be a cheeky response to wasaiyati. <laughs> I've had elders say that to me, and they, they were usually laughing. This is also good to say, like, uh, you know, raising kids. It's not always kids. Like, let's say we're sitting somewhere having coffee. At a table next to us, two people are having a pretty intense argument. You might catch the person you're sitting to, maybe they're a kid, maybe they're just your friend, but they are staring a little too hard, right? It's not your business. I say this to my kids if I want them to like, stop that, stop staring at them. This could also work, let's say, let's say we're at an event. And it's a kuyik. There's a little bit of drama within our clan about what's going on. So we're having a bit of an argument. And someone's there who is not in our clan. I might say, So please excuse us, but this isn't this isn't about you. It's none of, none of your concern, not your business. It could be rude in some cases, so be careful. Um, you know, but it just depends. A lot of that stuff depends on how well you know people and how you say the thing. Sha da ye ha wu ti. So we see three different suffixes here. De, ti, k. Those three things. We're going to look at the suffixes and see what they do, how they work. The whole sort of approach here learn a set of words, learn a set of suffixes looking at examples, trying them out, going into the stories, trying to find them. Ask questions if you go. Um, all of, when growing up, I always annoy my mom and try to like butt into her business and she'd always say tesh i dot at away. Yeah, and same thing. It means the same thing? Yeah. Okay. So it would be this or that. Oh. So that, yeah, so this is none of your business, that is none of your business. Slightly different, but they pretty much interchangeable in a lot of situations. Okay. Oh, you're cake and cheese. Just catching up on the chat. Uh, and that's a good one. It's a good one to know. Okay. Suffixes. Suffixes must attach to the noun. This is something I think a lot of 
lot of folks who learned maybe 20 years ago, like the rules weren't always clear. Right? So we're trying to get more clear about the rules just so we can be consistent. And it's not about wrong or right. It's just trying to teach folks like, remember, this is one of those things it needs a word to belong to, or it needs, you have to put a word there because it's got to attach right directly to it. We're going to learn about this thing called the empty base. Whenever you hear in, ide, or ich, like ach itidishi, there's an empty base right there. in kakwagut. There's an empty base right there. It's called an empty base because base means, when we're talking about Tlingit linguistics, Tlingit grammar, we say base to say it's a word you can put a suffix onto. That's all we're talking about. The relational part means it needs to belong to another noun. But a word like a pronoun, ach, i, du, ha, ye, hastu, you cannot put a suffix on any of those. You also can't put a suffix on a name. You can't say It just doesn't work. So the empty base is just E. These two E's right together. Doesn't mean anything. It's just there so you can put a suffix on that. Ach eat. I eat. Do eat. Ha eat. Ye eat. Has to eat. You've been using these things. Ach eat. Yan uwaha. It's right there. Eat. To arrive at. Okay? There are two rules when, when it comes to the tone. Open suffixes, day, will always be the opposite of the tone before it. Hit day. Nail day. Closed suffixes, they will be short and high. Dach, nach. What about nifu? That's too harsh. It's not of. It's not opposite of the suffix. It's the opposite of the the main tone of the word. Yes, the suffix is opposite of the preceding tone. But then the the. The open suffix is opposite of the main tone, even if it's the same as the suffix. Okay, so well, what we have here is nature. So here's, so we have nature, but we would have oh. abu, ah. and you can have ya. Oops, ya do. So it's opposite of the word. So we look at the word that it attaches to. So whenever we're looking at a suffix, it's the sound right before it that's going to trigger whether it's high or low. Good question. And this one too. Ka hui ka. That's high tone because this part right before it is low. So you would say sak nin ka, and that would be low. To go for bread. So hit day towards the house. Nechuh is at home. Oops, they are. Yeah. So on hit day, the day is attached to the whole word. Is it the same day that's in Kukwagut day? Isn't that separated? Yes, because that is going. Where were our days at? Right. That's this one. I'm going to go now. Good question. That goes back to the four days. So you could say, you could say, hit day kakwakut day. I'm going to go to the house right now. So what the day is doing on that verb, it doesn't have to go on commands. It's saying, right now. So kakwakut day. I'm going to go now. That's what the day is doing in there. All the pieces are coming together. Okay. Maybe we'll do one more. Then we'll just we'll start translating after this. We'll come back Thursday. Look at this again. It it takes some time to absorb, and uh, and we'll we'll find we'll keep looking at examples. 
So here's the suffixes. There's a lot of them, but this is pretty much all of them. Dach is from or out of or since. So they can mark time as well. Day, to, towards, or until. Nach, through, along, including the time of. T, coming to, arriving at, moving about at. W or U, uh, is, are, at. This one should not be used with a verb. It's a verbless phrase. Nesha hu, they're at home. If they're doing something or sitting or anything you're going to talk about with a verb, you got to switch it. This is the most common time marker. You want to say in the summer, kutan. In the winter, ta On Tuesday, dech yagig. That's how this one works. Uh, in January, awak disik. When you say yin as a time marker, I think that one's only ta yin in the nighttime. That's the only time I've ever heard yin. But usually, so you just put right on that. Yes, in the fall. But this is also at, and it's usually resting or residing at. The next kind of at, moving around in prolonged contact, repeatedly coming to. The CH doesn't really have to do with motion or being somewhere, location. It's about like who's doing the verb or what they're doing the verb with. And we'll look at examples of that. Like if it gets confusing who's doing the thing, you get some long sentence with like mother, father, or something in there. Achtlach, mother did it. Qa right? is going after or waiting for. This is a good one to know as well. There's usually you're going to use a verb like to be still or to sit somewhere. Or I'll sit here waiting for you. So that's That's what that one is used for. We'll be here waiting for you. Then the N is with. So it's another one of these things where it's really abstract, a whole bunch of concepts. Then we'll take it, we'll set it aside. Read the chapter, we're going to start looking at a whole bunch of examples, and we're going to go in looking for these things. It's a whole set of related concepts. It pushes a whole bunch of things together in, in terms of time, space, event, a whole bunch of different things like that. Okay, good enough cheese. Oh, okay. Okay. I was catching up on the chat. So I think this is where we uh, we did this last week without recording. So we'll do it again, and some of you might know, but we're going to look up some stuff. Uh, and just to recap for some folks that might not have been here as well. So we'll read it. Tell me the parts you recognize, but also feel free to say, like, I would like to know how this part is working. And we go look it up or we'll talk about it. So who would like to read this sentence? Sheesh. Oh. Everybody say, Kesh dasa. So as we read these things, we're always just watching the vowels. Long and high, long and low, short and high, short and high, short and low, long and low, long and low. A, 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 u, a. 
What do we got there? One of the parts we recognize. Um, Tishdasa, is that not much? Or mm. close? It's even less than that. Um, nothing. Oh, okay. Tishdasa is nothing. Mm. There's here's an interesting concept, and I was hanging out with my uncle. We we're talking about some people we we're mad at. It's none of your business why we're mad at them. What we were. And we're talking some trash. It happens sometimes. And he said, How would you translate that? Anybody know? Not quite. They said nothing? Or they asked? We gotta look at that. We don't know anything. Yeah, they don't know nothing, right? And so as, as, I thought it was funny because he said it, and he was, he's a big time elder. I won't say who. I won't say who it was about. I don't even ask. But I was impressed because I was like, oh, so if you have nothing, then the verb actually goes negative. So to think about how this works, I would probably say doesn't know anything. So the dasa turns into just a thing. And the klesh actually jumps over and links to the verb, which is also what's going on here. But nothing. What about uh? on is is light or shine? Yes, light or shine. So when we sort of do these verb investigations, which you're going to do as you translate these short stories, which are already typed for you in Tlingit, you're going to retype them, then you're going to do the translation work. So you can say, okay, gone is shine or something like that. So this is going to push you into the verb dictionary and you're going to look for gone. All right, let me jump back here real quick. So the things you're going to be looking for, I'll just type it over here. We know that there's a uh on there. We'll be able to tell that there's a kuh on there. There is actually this and this. And I don't expect you to know all of this stuff is there, but I want to show you that things are there so that you can start making some guesses. So when you see something like akugan or akawagan or something like that, you're going to look for ka. You're going to look for the ya classifier. We call it the zero these days. And you're going to look for gone. Because when we start looking at verbs, uh, the more we do this stuff, we're coming in with intention to find this specific verb. Because when we go into this verb root, gone, we're going to see quite a few different things here. So there's, there's an S classifier. That's not what we're looking for. Ka, ya, gone. That might be what we're looking for. To burn, to cremate, to scorch. Ka, de gone. There's no D classifier. There's no S classifier. You can look at these for fun and just to sort of continue to learn more verbs. But these, these are not, there's no D, up, kawa, gun. It could be this one. Burn catch a light. So here's something else. Now that we just talked about suffixes and bases and stuff. This is what they show you here. This capital A. This capital A has been replaced these days with a capital N. That means there's some noun and there is a suffix on that noun. So like, let's just go look up light and see if maybe that's our verb. So we're going to go down here to light. So 
So it's in at a couch again. Oh, we got there's an L. That's all I'm looking for. Okay. Not catch that. Okay. Oh, okay. This is what it is. So if you don't see an underline on the English, that means that verb is not listed in the English section of this dictionary. What I would do here is I would jump over to the Edwards dictionary or her database, which I have to find. Right here. So we're going to look up gone here. So we'll go down to the G's, gone, burn, catch a light. So we see at a cow gone, at catch at a cow gone, ach a kagan. So this gives us this ach that we, we see right in front of this, right? And so we look at this to burn, to catch a light, and this is probably the verb we are looking for. So here's ach, ach akugan. This is a negative form, and it says, it does not burn. When we add the da sa into it, how does that change it? Is it that? You can do the that, right? Yeah, well, so like the tesh ach, like if I were to say, if I just took the dasa, I'll put it back. If I took this out of here, a situation where I might use this verb is we're trying to build a fire and you grab something and you're trying to say, maybe we'll use this. It doesn't burn. That's what this, that's what this is saying. It does not. And what the verb is actually saying is like, you cannot light it on fire. That's really what it's saying. It cannot be lit on fire. So in this case, I would say nothing. And when you translate this stuff, it's really interesting because like the languages, they're just different. You could say nothing could be, nothing could start a fire, nothing could be lit, nothing could, I would probably just say nothing burned, which means you couldn't, you couldn't set anything on fire. To give, to give you some context, Raven story, way back mythical time, fire did not exist. Um, another time when I wrote down the ach, uh, it is, I wrote down a definition of at that place, at that time. Does that sentence have like a leaning either way? Like, yeah. nothing burned there or nothing burned at that time? Is there a preference in this case? Is that kind of up to interpretation? You could, yeah, you could say at that time, and I think it could be, like, that could be a thing, but that could also be at that place. And so, again, coming back to this idea of, like, time and space really being the same thing in Tlingit, it's, it's, it's open to interpretation. I don't even think, I think both of those are acceptable. <laughs> That's right. We're breaking the continuum. So is that that suffix underline x at? Yeah. For at? Well, not at. It's just ah. Uh. Uh. It's it's actually this ah. Uh. Uh. So it means that place or that thing, and you'll see it as ah or at. But you're going to see it with a high tone, and it does get confusing sometimes because there's a different at, right? Which is a thing, something. 
Okay, yuck. Hey, Johan. Let's see, where'd my cursor go? Okay. So this one is the three lines. It's lines two, three, and four. Who would like to read it? Kunach Kushikate Shan Ahu Ayagach Datin Waitak Ayi Sheesh. Again, a bit more context on this story. Uh, this is usually told directly after the sequence for the Raven stories. If we're going to tell them all, it's usually Raven. Raven and his uncle, where Raven is born and defeats his uncle, who is the moon, who then goes up and just starts being the moon. Raven, and then there's a flood because Raven's uncle floods the world. So Raven rebuilds the world with his sea otter, takes what's left over, throws it, and it becomes the Aleutian Islands. Then he flies out to the Aleutian Islands, and this is where we pick up. Just so we got some context because that's what it's going to be referred to here. Okay, what kinds of things do we recognize? Really. Really. Big Sean, dangerous. Yes. And so if we haven't encountered a word like this, like we should be able to sort of start predicting, like there's a, that looks like a verb, the ku and the she. In the hate, but then we've got the shun on there. And there's not very many verb roots that have two syllables. Kudzi, there's one. Ishan, there's another one. Niguach, there's another. Usually there's some kind of noun there, or some it's something else. But what we could do is take this whole word. We tried this the other night and it didn't work. Oh, we didn't have the recording on, so no one knows that it didn't work. Except I just said it didn't work. Dang it. Hate shun is scary or dangerous. Yeah, away. Oh, so with the newer dictionary, uh, because we're writing Klingit in a, in a specific way, like we can just enter that, and then we get it down here. Kushachit shun. Dangerous or scary. If we didn't know that word, we can sometimes do a copy and paste and it'll pop up in the dictionary. But what you have is you have the verb root hate, which is also hate. That means to be like uh, a lot of folks who start learning Klingit, they learn the word atskani. And atskani is like, yikes, ah, it's in the moment. It's what you say. To say like you are scared something is scary but it's not a verb so you couldn't say atskan it was atskani you can't really transfer that over into some sort of grammar that starts to change so this is the one you would say i was scared of it uh, and that's what this verb is doing like i was afraid of it there is this verb suffix Shun or chun, which means it is easily becomes this thing. And, and I'll show you some examples of that later. But for now, just know like this adds to this verb and it changes it from like someone was afraid of it to it was scary or dangerous. Okay, so now we got really dangerous or scary we'll see and we can as we do as you folks do your translation work which as you go through intermediate and into it you'll into advanced you're going to do more of this to the point where maybe i'll just give you some audio like there you go bring it back all done you got a semester to do it that's it's hard work but we're sort of doing this together to sort of figure it out what about ahu? Among. Among. Among, right? So the other thing is when we see a 
and then a space, and then this, we'll start to recognize these. Just like you learn how to spot a verb, you learn how to spot a postposition. It's the first time we've really been talking about them. Maybe we did some little stuff here and there. But again, if you go back to the dictionary, and we're going to go, I'm going to get rid of this thing. There's a bunch of stuff in my way. Okay. We'll clear this. We'll go down and we're going to look up who and it'll show us some information that we just now talked about. So this says it's a relational base. That means it can take a suffix. Who day, who dach, who t, who nach, among or in the midst of. This is a complicated verb, so I'm going to give it to you. In the perfective, this verb would be a yao de ti. So just like, so there's a whole bunch of stuff where it's like, we're going to learn how to spot this stuff. And there's some things that happen here. So if we looked at all the pieces that are in here, we're going to just copy this verb, bring it over to here, uh, among, we'll say among it. And then we're going to kind of give ourselves a little space and we're going to say, here's the parts that are in here. Those are the parts, right? When we just sort of pull this thing apart, these are built into the verb. They have meaning. This ya is that vertical surface we were talking about. Uh, some verbs just have this letter A attached to it, like achleich, achlun, it's just built in there, audagon. Usually what it does is it says focus on the action, not on whether there's an object or not. But sometimes it's just built in there. These two things together, oops, there's one more. These two things are saying we're putting the verb in a certain mode. There's going to be some things that go in these certain combinations to push the verb into these other modes. And then these two combine with this N to say when that verb is happening. It's a complicated verb form, and it's not like I did this when I did this. It's like whenever this thing is, it's this. So it's dangerous when it is stormy. And then that leaves us with we tochai. Here's we should be able to copy this one. Point of land. Okay. Is it a point of land? Yeah, there's a point of land, and we'll paste it up here. Is this one where I didn't find it? This rock is eh, right? Yeah. Oh, I think it's under that one. Maybe it's not under. So what we do have here is te plus ka plus yeah. So there's a couple things that go on that makes te change to ta. And this is kind of a weird thing that happens. So we did learn that when we put a suffix onto te, it changes it to a long low, a te yi. So te plus ka will push it to go te ka. But then the ye gets added, which turns the whole thing into a compound noun. So what happens is e goes long, but then it goes short. And when it goes short, it changes to a letter a. This does happen 
there's a bit of fluidity between this EI to an A vowel. I think we talked about this before, like when you have, uh, what is, we'll do this one down below, sorry. What is shale? Gravel or sand. Sand. What is dock? Is it towards the inland? Inland. What is ut? As a noun. Thing? Inland sand thing. But when we push this together and then we add the suffix, this also becomes a compound. So what happens is duck, dock goes short, ao also goes short, which means it goes to ao, and then ad. So we see this in clan names as well, these type of these ei to an a thing. It's just, there's a little bit of vowel like slipperiness, like these vowels, these vowels, these vowels, but sometimes they'll move around and jump to a whole other vowel. It's kind of wild. So we have a rocky point or peninsula. This is referring to the Aleutians. So we got to kind of sometimes go through and chunk it up, but now we have to rewrite this. How are we going to rewrite this so that it sort of has and, and there's a bit of a balancing act here as translators. The word order, you're going to have to uh, rearrange it a little bit, but then sometimes it's a negotiation. Where do you, how much do you want to move it around? Because really dangerous among its wind, stormy, that rocky point is a little too chunky, a little bit too in between Shingit and English. What do you folks want to do? It is really? Mm, it is really dangerous stay among it. When it is stormy at that rocky point? Where would that? Right? Yuck A! My brain exploded with all the compounds. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, my brain cuts you. <laughs> we did a lot. We did a lot. We did like the box and all the parts. Now there's <laughs> compounds and vowels sort of shifting. So good enough now. Just we'll keep moving through this and also going back to the, the sort of keep looking at examples. It does get complicated, but there will you will reach a point when all this stuff you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I know that stuff. And I kind of remember it when I didn't know that stuff. So it is, it's a big set of interconnected concepts. And Kuni, is that like contraction stuff that you were doing there with Shlake and Ut and all uh, the tuck? Like that's where my brain just like blew up because te becomes talk and like is there a place where, and I know English is like even worse, but is there a place where in your, one of your books where like those contractions are, um, that I could read over that to get it? Or is it just one of those things that you just have to learn as you're reading and it, um, Well, whenever you're compounding, you're going to kind of end up with like short, short, Whatever all the pieces are, they're usually going to all be short and then the last one will be long. Okay. And this is in how Senecha Yukatangi, but it's just kind of touched on to just say, this is how compounding works. When you're, you're going to make things into a, you know, like if you said Qat Hini, I would think, oh yeah, that Sakai has some water. It belongs to that Sakai. When you say Qat Hini, and it goes through this the compounding rules that I would then say, oh, that's a place that's called Sakai River. So there, there is a difference between how these things work. And we will, 
I don't know if I've ever really done a lesson on it, but I certainly can using things like shayate, which is sh ye at. But then there's another thing where you get like two vowels that come together, they'll have to change. Like in Hawaiian, you could just run those vowels right together. Like, yeah, just run them together. And they just, that's, I had a hard time with Hawaiian with the vowels. It's like they just run right into each other because in Tlingit, they either have to stop or they have to change and become something else. I would, would love a, le a lesson like that. If, there, if you feel like there's a pattern to it that I could, that would help me grasp it. Okay. Is there a word for brain melt? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. What about brain scorch? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I'd say, uh, well, you could say, um, like that's, that's probably the, the sort of like actual way you would say it which would be like, my thoughts are full. Mm. And there's, there's nothing you can say at any time. Sometimes, to be honest, I'm like, okay, cool, let's keep going. No, but other times I will pause, but you could say, if you wanted to be funny about it, uh, you could say, my brain blew up. <laughs> Oops, I got those last ones. And then, um, Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. So then I guess it depends. Like, this would be pretty funny, like saying, like, I am 100% done, right? Like, this is what you're communicating. If you want, <laughs> look at this, we just keep going. Achya kut wune. That would be, I am amazed. And what this literally means is, My thinking got lost. But it's a good thing, usually. It's like, oh, that's amazing. This one would be like, I'm getting kind of full, can't stuff more in. And this one is kind of being silly, like that little emoji with the exploding head. That's literally what this one would probably be. Okay, good enough now. <laughs> I'll go another 20 minutes. Good as cheese. Good as cheese. Good as cheese. Good as cheese. Ah. If I ever was to say that to an elder, like my brain exploded, do you think they'd look at me? <laughs> 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 like, what? Depends which one.